Hello, welcome to the show, everyone. Today we have on Barrett Brown. And, uh, you know, how, I don't know, how does someone introduce Barrett Brown? It's a really tough one because the personal, the professional, and the political stories all play off each other in numerous ways. Um, I would have to say that, first of all, Barrett Brown is one of far too few people to survive a very intense era of anti-authoritarian activism and state repression. In addition, Brown is a survivor of the innumerable disappointments that I feel have had a big impact on the way that things are right now. He is someone who has comprehended the contemporary moment and has participated in its unfolding with the skills at his disposal. And he is someone who has paid a big price for taking those risks. Naturally, his recently released book, My Glorious Defeats, Hacktivist, Narcissist, Anonymous, a memoir of Barrett Brown, is an excellent insight into what I just said. And though I'm only on chapter five, uh, it's really been an enjoyable read. So one of the things that Barrett is well known for is his relationship with Anonymous uh, at the peak of their hacktivist period. That's what we're going to be focusing on along with where Anonymous has gone from there. And um, on that note, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So uh, let's begin with a nice understatement. You've been through a lot. And uh, you just recently put out this your memoirs that really go over some of the the details of everything that you've gone through, what, the past 15, 20 years? Yep. And uh, like I said in the introduction, a big part of that has to do with your relationship with Anonymous, which uh, has what put you on my radar years ago um, as I was getting involved in different anarchist-oriented projects online, like Anarchist News, and the Anarchist Library, and things like that. And it was just a very different time. And I think a good way to start off, particularly because I don't know how familiar people really are with that anymore, is if you could just talk a little bit about what that time period was like, like with the zeitgeist movement and just like pre, pre the Arab Spring, like before any of that happened. In retrospect, it was a very interesting time, you know, let's, let's say between 2007 and 2012. Um, so Anonymous had its origins as a an emergent sort of internet culture movement, uh, and movement is the wrong word, an internet culture that uh, sort of came to fruition, it was incubated in uh, at 4chan uh, on the random board, as well as a few other online venues, like Encyclopedia like like Dramatica. So it developed its own its own symbology, uh, its own iconography, its own phrases, those were incorporated uh, along with a few of the people who were involved in Anonymous's early kind of prank stuff into the Anonymous, the movement. Anonymous, the the decentralized sort of left anarchist uh, movement that uh, really started, that, that gained true prominence in 2008 uh, with the attacks on the Church of Scientology uh, in, the, in its efforts to prevent the site Scientology from censoring the internet, which it was trying to do quite a bit in those days. Um, it became more prominent uh, when it went after the government of Australia in 2010 over proposed internet censorship legislation. By that time, uh, I, I've been familiar with this with this uh, subculture, uh, followed it pretty closely for a couple of years. Uh, I was brought in by one of the earlier sort of troll slash would be activists uh, who had kind of been invo heavily involved in the structure Scientology thing. I was I was brought in to assist when the Tunisian Revolution began. Uh, so by this time, early 2011, anonymous, there were several nodes of anonymous activity, particularly uh, Internet relay chat networks, from which all of this activist, these activist occurrences were being organized for the most part. Uh, that, that included the the right before the Arab Spring, right before the Tunisian Revolution, the, the most uh, most relevant action Anonymous had taken from these venues was in 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 service to WikiLeaks. Uh, it was it was uh, they were 
protecting WikiLeaks from some of the uh, attacks, some of the, some of the very novel attacks it was being subjected to by states and other uh, institutions uh, at that time. And at the time, you know, WikiLeaks was working with the New York Times, is working with every major outlet in the world on these releases of U.S. State Department cables. And at the same time, just like us, just like me going forward, it was also being treated uh, as an illegitimate uh, actor, as well as a, a legitimate subject of, of uh, state persecution by the military, intelligence, and, and uh, corporate uh, corporate intelligence activists. So uh, by the time I, I came in, uh, on, on January 1st, 2011, uh, the stakes were already really high. Uh, we had a number of Anans who were Tunisian nationals uh, who were there involved in the Tunisian revolution, uh, some of whom would be arrested and uh, later emerge and become members of the provisional government uh, that were working with us on different things uh, during that time. Uh, at the, meanwhile, we were being surveilled very aggressively uh, by ex-military intelligence contractors who were working directly with the FBI and directly with uh, Booz Allen Hamilton and other major intelligence nodes uh, of the Western world. So my role uh, going forward was strategy, helping with, with legal assistance to those who were being raided uh, in the U.S. and U.K. and elsewhere, uh, oftentimes as a consequence of not at all illegal behavior. Uh, and from there on, it, I, I took on a, a pretty uh, prominent uh role within anonymous within you know that that segment of anonymous and from there we we ended up in this conflict with some of the FBI and, and military intelligence people who were disrupting our, our work on the Tunisian revolution uh, and in the course of that conflict we obtained tens of thousands of emails and documents between the intelligence services and the, the private se- private intelligence sectors Palinger and so forth in which they lay out their uh, latest campaign against journalists, against labor union leaders, uh, against activist groups like Code Pink. Again, no one who is who's under, uh, no one who's being indicted, no one who's who's a actual criminal in the neutral sense. Uh, just activist groups and, and individuals and journalists who were, were deemed uh, undesirable by the DOJ and by these companies, which are very far right companies uh, in in. Outlook. Uh, so these things came out. Congress started to investigate. Uh, the press ran with it, w- w- what we uh, discovered. Uh, but within a few weeks, that had all kind of uh, gone to wash. Um, Congress, the congressional investigation into the things we'd uncovered uh, was shot down uh, by the Republicans. And uh, the FBI and DOJ, which had been found to be complicit in some of these uh, some of these campaigns, uh, instead started prosecuting us. Uh uh, and that there was a, there was a long period of surveillance, of secret grand jury search, search warrants, accessing all of our information. There was there was a number of assets that they brought on um, that we'll get into later because this this will form a very important part of the story going forward. Uh, who were there to uh, to reduce the impacts we have with the press, to reduce our credibility uh, to the public, uh, and to soften us up for eventual charges by the FBI or by uh, Metropolitan Police in the UK and and the other police and intelligence services that had been working very cl- in close tandem against us uh, ever since the beginning of our efforts to assist the democratic revolution in Tunisia. So that's how, that's how this all starts. And uh, from there it gets more and more complicated uh, and more and more uh, upsetting, you know? Yeah. Uh, so one of the big things that, you know, at least since like 1999 has been grand jury trials and, using those as a way to tie up activists and prevent them from being able to do any kind of activism at the very least, let alone uh, blow all the resources from activist communities on the trials and the defense and everything. How much, I didn't see it mentioned, did grand juries play much into the way that prosecutions were uh, taken against people involved with anonymous Absolutely. Uh, so, and, and this is one of the great things about this story is that so much of what is normally undocumented uh, here has been documented in terms of, you know, we have, we have all the grand jury filings in my case and a few other cases we have, we have the surrounding materials. So, so we can kind of, this is a great opportunity for anyone who, especially people who are doing serious work in the activist space uh, to be appraised of how this process works, what you need to be worried about, 
who you need to be worried about in the case of a number of individuals that are still uh, unaccountably uh, still active uh, targeting activist groups 15 years later, despite having already been outed as FBI assets. Uh, so in my case, the grand jury, the, the, the Palantir and a few other firms that we'd exposed as being involved in this in this campaign against journalists and labor union leaders, they went to the FBI and DOJ, which, of course, was already involved in this and already had a stake in seeing it suppressed. And they got uh, very easily a grand jury, grand jury search warrant, a sealed search warrant that I wouldn't know about until later, uh, into all my communications on an ongoing basis, starting right then. Um, and that carried on through December of 2011 when, when the hack of Stratford occurred that they would later, that the government would later retroactively claim was the reason they had been uh, heavily investigating me for nine months before the hack happened. Uh, you know, they, they're, they can see into the future of these people. Um, and it would carry on, you know, throughout the rest of my incarceration even. Uh, in fact, a lot of my a lot of the remaining files on me are still sealed, the DOJ files and BOP files, uh, despite repeated requests that they be made public uh, on the grounds that I am, that this concerns ongoing criminal investigations. So from the very beginning, uh, going forward to my release in 2016 from prison, going forward to today, uh, me and those around me, including those who are still alive, those who haven't yet uh, died of suicide or drug overdose or, or in some cases, less clear uh, causes, uh, this is an ongoing thing. It's an ongoing thing that uh, has a extremely close relationship with major subjects, 2016 election, uh, the, the election to come, the Trump, Trump's associates, General General Flynn, uh, the people who founded the QAnon thing, this, my hand, my fingerprints are all over this. And the fingerprints of people like Aaron Schwartz, Michael Hastings are all over these people and institutions. Several years before they get caught uh, assisting Trump with this illegal and irregular um, data mining campaign under Cambridge Analytica. Uh, so that's that. That's the most important takeaway before we get getting into the details, uh, I think, about this, is, is that it's not just an interesting story. It's not just a story that it should be of interest to activists who might be targeted by the feds. Uh, it's what we've documented here and what I've documented in my book and in pretty much all the presentations I give are the failures across the board of the press, uh, of activists, uh, of the activists, the NGOs that support activists, uh, individual reporters, individual Democratic Party functionaries, the, their failure to stop the alt-right emergence and, and the neo-Nazi emergence when it, when it could have been stopped in 2011. Uh, its ongoing policy of protecting their own reputations, whether it be career reputations or whatever, from the facts of this matter, even insofar as the facts today, if, if properly presented, could be used uh, to alleviate some of these some of these issues. Uh, so what we see in this book is a lot of sociopathy. We see we see also a lot of uh, something less than sociopathy. We see individuals who are failing in their positions for one, way, one reason or another. Sometimes they're being encouraged to fail uh, by people they're dealing with. They don't know who they are, but they're whatever. Um, and in almost no cases do we see anyone who is either responsible for how we got here or who in some cases are still uh, holding high positions at the Washington Post or the Democratic Party or um, anonymous and so forth, where, where we never see them sort of get, come forth and say, you know what, I was wrong about this, or I got I got conned by this person who's FBI asset. Um, this is a big deal. Let me come clean about what I know uh, so as to protect the public. We see that in almost no occasions. And I'm, and I'm including in that Julian Assange, uh, other other figures in this, in this transparency movement. Uh, and that, as we'll get to, I suppose, that is really the, what we're up against. We're not really up against the state. Uh, we're up against the lack of uh, civic, a sense of civic virtue, a sense of duty, even on the part of those uh, who we would most expect it from and who we most need it from. And that's 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 the rot that we're looking at. Um, it, you know, it, it, aside from this, this issues like surveillance, disinformation, uh, Israel, um, uh, climate change, and, and every single issue. Uh, that is of value uh, to well-meaning people around the world. 
every single issue is wrapped up in this key uh, factor whereby disinformation uh, has, has been developed as an art uh, with the help of the CIA and other companies um, and has been deployed over and over again in ways that we can sometimes catch them doing and expose them again. Uh, it's been deployed over and over again in effective ways that are directly responsible for how things have gone in the U.S. and the U.K. and elsewhere in the last uh, 15 years. So it's a tragic book. It's a tragic story. Yeah. It is. I also, you know, one other way to look at it, I think it also documents a very deep change in the way that society works um, yes. over the over this time period. And when I think something I do in my head quite often is I compare the time when Anonymous was releasing videos and doing everything, you know, I guess leading up to and through Occupy to this period of QAnon. And just looking at the difference between those two situations, I think, uh, is one way to see, I guess, to kind of contextualize the cultural and social changes that, that uh, your story tells and your book tells and just everything you've been through and that this movement has been through. Um, yeah, it's not yeah, go ahead. Oh, I, I want to get to it eventually, the stuff about QAnon, because in my head, that's sort of like it marks when I started thinking differently about Anonymous as even as a strategy. And um, I don't know if you want to get to that now. I think we should do some more background, but. Well, so we might be able to do both at once simply because this, these are very closely related issues. So as as anyone who reads the, the New York Times review of my book from a couple of days ago or you know, one of the other of the accurate, competently written reviews that kind of go over the subject matter here, uh, you'll have a sense that, you know, what happened with Anonymous back in its earlier days when it was very successful, again, you know, in the Tunisian Revolution and in, in, in exposing and, uh, and disrupting uh, ongoing plots by FBI, CIA, local police, uh, Bank of America, uh, plots against us, against activists, against journalists. Uh, it, its peak was reached back then, in 2011. Uh, it began to decline in large part because the FBI had secretly, without our, without our being aware of it, uh, had discovered and turned uh, one of our most prominent uh, participants, a hacker by the name of Hector Monsignor, who lived in the projects in New York City. Uh, and he, this this fellow, uh, who had been again a very prominent f- front-facing figure in, in this, as well as someone who, who did pull off several uh, talented hacks against uh, targets, um, he was taking care of his nephews and nieces, and you know, and this thing, and, and was not in a position to go to prison, uh, which is something he probably should have thought of before he did all the prisony stuff. You know, he was you know he was going to get caught for. It. But at any rate, he. decided to comply with their uh, with their wishes. And so from that point on, in, in about July of 2011, he was, he, this person, Hector Monsignor, known as Sabu, uh, he was one of a couple of people, including myself, who were kind of the go-to for the press, uh, who were seen as, you know, de facto leaders of, of some of these, uh, obje- some of these operations. And he was working for the FBI, as the FBI, on an FBI-provided laptop. So that tells us a number of things. It doesn't tell us as much as we might think it does, but it tells us a number of things. Number one, uh, the major hacks that occurred after that, that after after he was became an FBI asset, after Anonymous itself was, in some senses, uh, had become, uh, had gone under the partial de facto control of the FBI, the hacks it committed and some of the statements it put out uh, were done explicitly with FBI oversight, with FBI knowledge, sometimes with the FBI direction. The hack on Stratfor, the intelligence contracting firm uh, out of Austin, Texas, that turns out to have been spying on Bhopal activists uh, for Union Carbide and uh, PETA and other groups, uh, and which turned out to have worked very closely with Israeli intelligence, uh, Israeli, pri- Israeli private intelligence firms like Wikistrat, uh, so forth. That hack uh, was not perpetrated by Jeremy Hammond. Uh, it was perpetrated 
by one FBI asset, who then passed it on to another FBI asset, Hector Monsignor, who then passed it on to Hammond. Uh, that's something that Hammond's defense later uh, pointed out uh, somewhat quietly. Um, it that information did not make it to my defense until after I was sentenced. Sentenced, but uh, it's um, right there. We have a great example of what anonymous can become to the extent that we don't have an apparatus to make sure we're not being uh, we're not we're not being captured by our adversaries. Uh, and that's a great segue into what happened later, uh, more recent years. Uh, despite the fact that Sabu, Hector Monsignor, and all that the, are, are now known FBI assets, and Aaron Barr, who, who was the ex, ex-Navy intelligence uh, fellow who ran this H.B. Gary firm and and, uh, and made his way into anonymous as IRCs and pretended to be anonymous, despite all these things having been publicized, and despite having some of the other FBI assets, like Neil Rauhauser, who come up in a lot of our prosecutions, despite these things all coming out over and over again in documentaries and, and articles and so forth. Uh, Anonymous has once again sort of been subjected to considerable state capture in the last few years involving some of these same people, including Neil Rauhauser, uh, including, uh, including Weave, uh, uh, Andrew Arnhauer, the, the head of uh, one of the Nazi groups that works closely with Peter Thiel and so forth. Uh, and they've been under control of the apparatus that remains, including the you're, you're a non-news account on Twitter and a few other things, uh, Distributed Denial of Secrets, which is a pseudo-activist group. Uh, these, these have all been sort of under their control and the control of several lawyers uh, who work for Peter Thiel directly for a number of years to different extents. And that is something we've put out in terms of, you know, so we have screenshots, we have these, some of these FBI assets bragging and admitting about their role. Uh, we have the head of DDOS, um, uh, being outed as having changed their name in 2014 uh, to avoid further scrutiny into their what they signed, you know, and, and uh, under oath to be counterintelligence operations. Uh, we have we just have everything that you would that worked fine in 2011 when people were very serious about these kind of things and were willing to, you know, look into the dangerous possibilities that you know there, there were assets involved. We have those things, but we have there's very little we can do with them. Uh, and so, whereas our one of our great strengths in 2011 was being it was having a very honest relationship with the press, whereby they knew they could come to us and get, you know, files showing some huge scandal and that we wouldn't bullshit them. You know, we wouldn't be doing crisis, crisis management stuff and just telling them nonsense like everyone else. That is no longer the case. Um, not because certain aspects of the press don't still trust this anonymous apparatus that I've referred to, this, this current modern version, uh, but because the ones in the press who do trust them uh, are working with them knowingly uh, in tandem with U.S. intelligence and the FBI and so forth. Uh, and that's that explains, for those who are wondering, why when the U.S. invaded Ukraine, why the, the focus of these groups, this apparatus, uh, became so strictly aligned with sort of a centrist uh, centrist U.S. agenda. And it also might explain why people who have followed these things closely might have seen here and there um, revelations about the individuals being FBI assets. It's because they are. Um, and there are one of the great lessons here. <clears throat> Number one is that it doesn't matter if something gets exposed, gets exposed. It doesn't matter if an FBI asset, even one of the most disgusting ones who was involved in swatting uh, his targets, uh, who was involved in setting up activists uh, successfully uh, for things he had done. The fact that that person was still and still is uh, able to work so closely with uh, these modern Anons uh, kind of tells tells you that we lost. We lost the battle in 2011 uh, for uh, the, the battle for control over the public attention. We lost the battle to be able to inform the press of things the public needs to know. We lost the individual battles over and over again to get careerists in the press and in the anthropology departments, universities and so forth, to get them to um, look at our, our data. Because those people have since all since sort of been compromised in different ways, to different degrees by these FBI assets. Um, and the, the, the tra tragic the thing we keep seeing, especially as we quietly go to the individual reporters, editors, activist figures, lawyers, uh, 
we find that there is very little interest in acknowledging uh, acknowledging these failures and acknowledging the ongoing uh, impact it has on that it's had on people who died just the past couple of years, including Val Brokesmith and Kevin Gallagher, who I'll go into later, the impact it's had on, on me and those, those who work with me. Uh, there's just, there's, there is a, the more you see of it, uh, the more upsetting it gets. Uh, and mm-hmm. I finally got to the point, luckily the last few months, last year or so where I'm kind of recovered, but it took its toll on me learning all this. It took its toll on me seeing these betrayals of, of dead activists, ongoing betrayals, uh, on the very subjects that they gave up a lot of their lives for, in some cases they're actually their whole lives. And it's very disturbing to see people who came into the, the legal defense apparatus for all of us uh, turn out to be uh, very close with the alt-right and FBI. Um, it's very it's very disturbing to see them uh, so, in, so thoroughly entrenched, despite everything uh, some of us have done in the past two years to, uh, to bring this to light. And so anonymous... I'll just end by conclude this by saying anonymous is done. It is no longer whatever it once was and whatever you want to think about it as a movement, as an idea, whatever. Uh, it is it is no longer useful and is, in fact, exact opposite of useful uh, insofar as your ideals are transparency, honesty, uh, informed consent, uh, much less, you know, difficult operations targeting powerful entities uh, it is no longer capable of doing any of that uh, by design. On, on the part of some and, on, and elsewhere because of just the, the institutional failures that uh, that have brought us to this point. Yeah, uh, it's very sad to watch. You know, I, I think as far as the like the anarchist circles that I'm more involved in, the, the stuff that makes it into into our vision is has a lot of it's been the Jeremy Hammond case. And a lot of the other stuff seems to become marginal uh, in the way that anarchists are thinking about the world, which is something I would love to change if it's fucking possible to do that. But there, there was, you know, this is kind of off topic, but there was a moment when uh, anarchists were paying more attention to this stuff too. And I clearly it, this is tied into what you're saying that the whole conceptual like framework for doing activism as anonymous and and all, we've just seen the compromises happen over and over again we've seen the the prison sentences the suicides all the all the tragic stuff and i think that the general feeling is that it this is over i think you're uh, quite clear yeah. on that um the- one of the one of the things i read i don't think it was in um your book, I think this was somewhere else, but it was just a short line I read down is the country's intelligence agencies would be recast as deep state heroes investigating Russiagate and Trump's perfidity. That was a line from the New York uh, magazine profile last year. Yeah. And that's absolutely what happened. That, and that's, that's another big big tragedy here. By the the time I got out of prison, you know, in uh, late 2016, uh, the democratic party and basically everyone who was in, a portion of the anti-fascist community, I suppose, uh, were uh, primarily a Democratic Party, were very set on the idea that this Robert Mueller guy, this Republican appointee FBI director, was going to be the savior of democracy and that he was going to investigate uh, and find out what what collusion existed between Russia and, and oligarchs elsewhere and what collusion existed with uh, Cambridge Analytica. I mean, their, their, their uh, charter for the Mueller investigation was very broad. It wasn't just Russia. It was all these companies, including the ones that we used to investigate and that got the FBI to come after us. Um, and some of those companies did emerge in that investigation. Michael Flynn's company, that, that uh, Michael Flynn had met with Stratfor uh, a short time before the hack on Stratfor uh, that I went to prison for. Um, Michael Flynn then set up his own company, Flynn Intel Group, and also partnered with another company that he had a half interest in, uh, White Canvas Group. And these firms both came up briefly in the Mueller investigation later on. And this is mentioned in the Washington Post and so forth. It, it had been leaks to. You never see those those names again when the Mueller report finally comes out. And this was something I predicted at the time publicly, uh, it, because it so happens that those firms and a lot of the other firms involved that had turned out to have been had played a key role in the data mining and targeted disinformation campaign that, that helped Trump get into office. These were the very same companies, the very same individuals 
that we had exposed, that we had warned about. By we, I mean Michael Hastings, me, Aaron Schwartz, uh, a number of people who, you know, who are no longer around um, and journalists and so forth. Very same companies. And worse, these were the very same companies that Mueller had protected when he was director of the FBI. And even worse than that, it's, these are the companies that he bragged about protecting in a speech he was get, that he was given after I was already in prison and under a gag order. He gave it to, in, the, in front of the FBI. Uh, it's, there's, a, there's a text version of it online uh, where he brags about how Stratford was an FBI hack and so forth and uh, how he got you know six hackers out of that. But what he means is five hackers and me. Um, so this is a person that the Democratic National Convention, you couldn't tell them otherwise. You couldn't tell them, hey, the FBI... I've met them before. I've, I've got an opinion about that their willingness to do this properly. You couldn't tell them Mueller is not going to do this properly. You couldn't tell them that Mueller is going to cover cover him for himself and for his agency and for his corporate partners and for his ideological partners. Uh, they wouldn't believe it. And, of course, what happened gradually is he, he slow walked it and uh, the report came out and nothing was done. And if, even the things that could have been pointed to in the report involving the firms that created QAnon, the firms – that in Israel and the U.S. and elsewhere that were found, caught, admitted, boasted of assisting Trump through various means, uh, techniques of the same sort that we used to uh, yell about to everybody. Um, those things just didn't take. They didn't come into the national consciousness, with the exception of a few people like myself who can afford to paint this history correctly since I come out looking good in it. You know, um, So what we have here is a thing where a lot of reporters don't Everyone's gone on record saying, oh, this this is going to happen. This definitely happened, blah, blah. Um, these, these things don't happen or they're wrong. Or in some cases, like with the New York Times, uh, whose um, national security intelligence reporter, Nicole Porroth, um, denounced claims of the, that the FBI led the Strapper hack as conspiracy theories in an article she wrote shortly after my, my raid. Uh, you know, only for that later to be attested to by the FBI and now the New York Times itself just ran a review in which they acknowledged that, yes, it was the FBI that oversaw this hack that Jeremy Hammond and I and others were prosecuted for. Um, this is another instance where we have careerists uh, or worse in positions at the New York Times, at Washington Post, in some anarchist organizations, uh, particularly here in the UK, uh, that were complicit in a lot of these things, um, remain, remain complicit and have been not just willing but effective in see, preventing other people who might want to know these things from knowing them. And that's one reason why the anarchist community, well before this, this current incarnation, would have lost a lot of interest in subjects that were clearly of importance to them. Uh, because we have a disinformation problem that, that's very far reaching. Uh, and the biggest problem of it is that very few people want to admit uh, that they can be fooled. Um, everyone wants to think everyone else is, is the disinformative target, blah, blah. It is very hard for a person, even a relatively noble person, <clears throat> to acknowledge themselves, hey, I was tricked into doing this. This person has now come out as an FBI asset. Uh, I, the effects of my actions were to uh, delude the public uh, about things that have since become clearly important to the public. Uh, and, you know, my, my actions also had an impact on individuals who are now dead. None of these people whether in the press uh, or in the activist sphere or, uh, you know, freedom of the press foundation or, or other group have been willing to, to assist in that. There are people who are lesser known, who have been watching these, these sort of same matters, watching these same assets, documenting them, who uh, provide tremendous support to what I do when I go out and put these things out. But for the most part, we, it's been a disappointing ride uh, seeing what people that we once looked up to, uh, seeing what they've done, even, even when the stakes are really low for them themselves and, and high for everyone else. So that's that's another great issue that needs to be addressed. How do we how do we figure out who our heroes are and, and figure out which ones are con artists before we spend years and years like I did serving them? You know, because Glenn Greenwald and Julian Assange, those were my two heroes back in 2010, 2011. Both of those men I, I became acquainted with, got to had to work with on these high stakes thing, things. Uh, and both of them, particularly Grimwald, who really, you know, unlike Assange, didn't really have much that he accomplished beforehand to sort of to uh, sort of cancel out his later on his later crimes. Uh, 
vastly disappointing, uh, became vastly and increasingly cl- cl- complicit in what Peter Thiel and the alt-right was going to do. They worked directly with uh, Weave, Andrew Arnheimer, the, the Nazi, uh, setting up corp- surveillance corporations, defending them, setting up disinformation outfits like Rumble, uh, all the while taking in money and prestige on the grounds that they are that they are activists, they're transparency activists, setting up a whole company, The Intercept, founded by, well, I'll, I'll leave it there, we'll probably get into that separately, but You'll hear you'll hear me coming back to this over and over again, uh, and I'm I'm getting a little bit better at at not rambling about it and not uh, uh, cursing, but it's just it's it's so terrible. Um, There's a lot there, it. though. It's I mean, yeah. oh, one thing that I know you know has been on uh, been a topic of conversation is like some of these anti-fascist uh, activists who have started working with intelligence community organizations uh, under the you know with the supposed hope that this is going to advance like an anti-fascist agenda. Yeah. How, how should, how should we look at people who are doing that? Uh, we should, we should, there's a couple of objective ways. There's a couple of correct objective ways to look at different individuals in that one, basically under two categories. One is, is a person who has a degree of, of awareness uh, of what they're doing because they're doing it you know, because they're being spurred on, not by cutouts, but directly with intelligence, intelligence agencies, uh, police agencies, and so forth. We look, we should look at them differently. Then there's those, the much, the bulk of them who are not aware, even of the basics of what they're doing and who they're doing it with, who have been conned, like so many of us have over and over again, uh, into doing the work of the enemy for them. Um, so one good example uh an ongoing example is there's a gentleman uh, who was based in London until recently who was openly advocating not just for surveillance against activist groups uh, on the left, but a specific surveillance operation that had been conducted by uh, MI5 in conjunction with several journalists and several uh, professors, uh, whereby they were targeting groups like here in the UK, one of our, our best outfits is uh, Declassified UK. Uh, they were targeting them as potential Russian disinformation operators, which which they're just simply not. And again, I'm I'm not a I'm by no means a pro-Russian, and and by no means do I discount or dismiss the effect of Russian of of Duganist uh, philosophy and, and and FSB tactics. Uh, these are real things that affect people all over the world. They they are not they're not the friends of anarchists anyway, but. In that particular case, uh, we those emails, the emails between these MI5 people and reporters were hacked, probably by Russian intelligence, because they came out via an outlet that's known as basically a mouthpiece for the Kremlin. Uh, so we were able to see what, exactly what they were doing, what they were telling each other, and also what they were telling us, because one of these people, this prominent individual, was in my signal group with me and a bunch of other activists who are targeted regularly. Um, and spying on us on their behalf. And then even after these things came out, was asked, was trying to get us to take their side uh, and help them troll, literally troll, like some of the people who were pointing out what was in the emails. Uh, just bizarre, atrocious behavior. Um, then, then again, it's my responsibility for those people being in the group in the first place. I, I should have checked. Uh, you wouldn't know it from seeing a lot of commentary about me, but my, my real sin is being overly naive, not overly paranoid. At any rate, so... This operation, which involved Paul Mason, a, a, a reporter here in the UK, and also involved Dr. Emma Bryant, a longtime associate of mine, who is known publicly as a uh, someone, someone who's investigated Cambridge Analytica, who's less known for having been the editor of a NATO psyops journal uh, and a few other uh, unfortunate things. Um, in this instance, where they were caught spying on us and other groups that are close to freedom, the freedom uh, publishing and freedom the newspaper. That you know about. Um, this person advocated for that particular operation, even after it came out, and was and was and was arguing against, was arguing with uh, my partner Sylvia Mann before she became, became editor uh, about whether or not it was okay for them to do those things. That person, unfortunately, is a long time is a husband. He's, he's an Israeli citizen uh, and is a husband of the former editor of Freedom, um, which has a large part to do with why. We got involved with freedom to begin with. Uh, there were some concerns there involving ongoing surveillance of, of not just freedom itself, which you know they put on a newspaper, that's great, but also outfits that are uh, overlap with freedom that do very, very important work 
that is very easy to, uh, that can go wrong quite easily. Um, so even, so we have, and, and this is, this is also, this is something that applies to everything else I'm talking about here. Even when we have that information, even when we, this guy's publicly, this person's publicly putting out, advocating for these surveillance operations against his fellow activists and anarchists and advocating for a specific operation that's just occurred, targeting many of us and groups close to freedom where his wife was the editor. Uh, there's not much you can do with that information. You can't really go to the freedom collective and be like, Hey, this is kind of concerning. Uh, likewise with other things that kind of came out of the, from that same person, and a few others, uh, who are Israeli partisans, uh, who are basically partisans of the Likud party uh, and who masquerade as anarchists. Uh, there's just not much you can do, uh, in terms of getting that group to say, Hey, this is serious. It needs to be addressed. Um, it's a threat, ongoing threat to everyone involved. Uh, and even if this, even if you discount that, it's a pretty good stress test for how well we're doing in terms of protecting our participants and volunteers and contributors from uh, police intelligence and, and adjacency uh, sort of infiltration of the sort that happens all the time. So, so the spaces that most that need to be safest, of course, are the ones that are going to be targeted the most. Uh, not just, and to go back to your question, sorry, this is probably a better way to explain this. Uh, this, this person is one of the people who doesn't probably have a good understanding of what they're doing and of what the impacts are, uh, but who is almost certainly like, who I, I know to have been in touch with and his wife with FBI assets who had reached out to them for different purposes and who seem not to have taken that seriously either. Um, and so as we go forward, what we find, what you find is, the more we exp the more we can document, the more we catch people doing things, uh, the harder it gets for us because now we've got we've got a number of individuals close to these institutions who, even aside from their ideological shortcomings, are not interested in being shown wrong, much less uh, dangerous. And so, and then you have other people who are just not following the thread very carefully. They see these things like, oh, this is drama. This is a this is a uh, turf war. Other, other terms that actually FBI assets love to use in, on Twitter and so forth to try to to try to deter uh, interference or to deter uh, close attention. Uh, and we find that you know repeatedly that uh, these organizations are not safe. The organization I started, I mean, to be fair, pursuance after I got out of prison was not safe. Uh, it was infiltrated very quickly by a number of people who were working with these FBI assets who were, were ex-military intelligence. Uh, in some cases, we found that out later on. In some cases, we didn't. Um, and uh, and so that should go to show, given that this is something that was one of my chief subjects, but chief areas of interest and expertise, uh, it's taken even me a number of years to root out a number of the collaborators and assets uh, and their associates uh, from out, even when I have the ability to do so without asking anybody's permission. That should give you a sense of how real this, this problem is, uh, how pernicious it is. And how how uh, how doomed how inherently doomed any any project that's seen as viable by the enemy uh, how doomed that project is by virtue of the ease with which they can infiltrate dismiss disrupt prosecute uh, drive people to suicide and brag about it later and then get brought into another group two weeks after that uh, it's it's uh, it's an issue and it's why I don't organize anymore uh, for now. I only work very closely with, with other people. Um, yeah. So that's, that's a larger question of why is anonymous no longer, no longer exist as such or why shouldn't it exist? Why, you know, why are so many great ideas that we've heard, you know, from about, about different forms of collective uh, activism and research. Why are these projects not getting off the ground? So in some cases, it's because people like me aren't very good organizers. In some cases, it's another, there's another reason for it. Until that issue is addressed meaningfully, honestly, openly, and thoroughly with the documentation that uh, subject matter experts have accumulated over the years, until that thing is addressed within the anarchist community, the, the anarchist community will not be viable. Until it's addressed within the, within the U.S. press, even among the elements of the U.S. press that are not terrible, it will not be viable. It's anything except for a vector for further disinformation by the FBI. The fact that there's a New York Times review of my book that came out last Friday that gets the, the themes right and has no inaccuracies is extraordinary. It's shocking to me uh, because that has not been the case uh, for the most part in the last 10 years. Um, and so anyway, that's that. Again, that's not the only keep going back to you. We, the, every issue, climate change, every issue, none of, none of these will be solved by us or anyone else.
outside of the power structures until we have a handle on uh, how, how our groups, how our structures are seized uh, and redirected by sophisticated and not so sophisticated bad actors uh, with the state and corporate intelligence. Until then, nothing will happen. Nothing good will happen. Well, that's a, yeah. Uh, so what would you, I mean, there's a certain like set of skills that go into even being able to report on these kind of organizational vulnerabilities and the way that, you know, put together a proper like dossier or whatever on some of the, these people that come into our organizations. And I don't know if those skills themselves are really being learned and taught. And I think, you know, as, as some kind of step towards, uh, improving this situation that you just described, what would, what are the types of things that people should be trying to learn how to do? Yes. Um, uh, absolutely. Um, so there's, there's several, th- several takeaways I have from the last 12 years, or 13 years of, of doing this, of having to do this. This was not a subject that I had any interest in along with cyber security and, and uh, surveillance before 2011, when this, when this, these things popped up in front of us. But uh, number one, uh, Ask around if you have uh, an individual that's uh, presenting himself in a certain way, uh, providing, you know, claiming to be from this and this or on this. Uh, just ask, search their name, see what comes up. Uh, that's a basic thing that had it been done by some of the more prominent journalists here in the UK who were very highly regarded by um, a lot of people. Uh, had they done that, they would not have uh, ended up actually working with Neil Rauhauser. Uh, this longtime FBI asset who works with far right neo-Nazi groups and is now parroting himself as a disinformation expert in the Washington Post, which is now attached to this this FBI, this Fed from my previous case. Uh, that's an easy thing. Uh, there are some basic sort of heuristics we can all use, like uh, when we're evaluating, if someone's claiming this person's a bad actor, uh, does they have evidence, they have documentation? Does this person who's, who's claiming this do they have a track record? Do they constantly call people this uh, or have they only on a few occasions where they've been proven correct and the, 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 where the, the uh, asset has added himself or documents have come forward make, showing without a doubt that they are an asset? Has that happened? Uh, if so, that, you know, the person making that claim should perhaps get some benefit of the doubt. Uh, does, you know, and, and this, so a lot of this takes the form of having to uh, come into a some sort of dispute between two parties that you may or may not one may or may not know both one of both of them. Uh, in in those disputes, the assets and so forth, uh, their chief goddamn dog asset. Um, their their chief method of ensuring that it doesn't matter when they're caught is to follow a couple simple. It might be easier to list the rules they follow. Number one, uh, emphasize and falsely claim that this is a drama or turf war thing. Uh, number two, uh, reach out to the various journalists and other individuals, work with them on some in some fashion, um, take, get them to take a overt step towards uh, dismissing the information about them or attacking the, the messenger, you know, whether it be me or whoever else, so that in later on, if things come out that are very convincing, uh, vis-a-vis, you know, the, the FBI asset is working with reporters or, or so forth, um, that person will be disinclined to pursue it further because they're already implicated. Um, so the dog kind of distracts me there. Um, they, there's a number of phrases uh, that people will use uh, when they are caught uh, in some respect, uh, engaging in what they know to be disinformation. Uh, they'll often respond by claiming, I wish you the best. You know, I know, I know you, you know, they'll, they'll say something to give the appearance that they're really, they're not really mad at you. They're just worried about you. And that's obviously mm-hmm. we're very, some people are very simple. With that. Obviously with my history, drug use and so forth. And the fact that a lot of articles claim I'm mentally ill, which I am, I have depression. I was diagnosed with as a child. Uh, it's very easy. It's very easy for those who get caught up in these things on the other side with FBI assets. It's very easy for them to tell themselves that there's nothing to it, that the person is just crazy. He gets to fight with everyone. He thinks everyone's an FBI agent. And the person, the FBI said, will tell them, will feed them those kinds of, uh, those kinds of memes. 
to help make it easier for them to remain complicit and to uh, you know, continue what, what they're doing towards the rest of us. Uh, there, there, there is, there are protocols by which a big, a great sort of dossier could be created uh, on the assets that we know. And that was one of the things we were uh, working to do uh, a couple of years ago uh, before a couple of the participants died. Um, and ha having been targeted again by some of the same people we were, we were trying to uh, detail, some of the same FBI assets. Um, that's not something I could probably, uh, in terms of specifics, that's not something I could probably effectively or productively go into. But just basically, it just comes down to if, if you're going to, to weigh in or refuse to weigh in or something like that, just um, on one of these disputes, um, just take as much care as you can not to uh, not to do anything that you'll feel bad about if you turn out to be wrong. Um, like refrain from weighing in if you see a, a, a conflict between two people claiming each other assets uh, until you've kind of done the, the background research. Uh, don't dismiss any claims of, of, of an asset, whether it be against me or or by me, for instance, simply because it sounds like drama or crazy. Like just. Uh, I guess familiarize yourself with the things that we have put out that we do that we can document uh, about how these things work, how the FBI uh, recruits, uh, how they sometimes recruit without knowing the person's recruited. There's a great article. Uh, there's a couple of articles um, that I could recommend. There's a couple I wrote myself that document what we have on these, these, these recordings of the FBI meeting in, in Los Angeles in 2020, uh, where they were discussing me and a few other uh, uh, targets discussing them with assets they had, including the people that distributed their health secrets, this pseudo uh, activist group. Uh, and we have recordings of phone calls between that asset, who was also a whistleblower before he came to asset, and his FBI handlers. And those things that, that they've been transcribed and so forth. So anyone can go look up Barrett Brown, Val Brokesmith, B-R-O-E-K-S-M-I-T, and see some of the things we put out on Medium and so forth with, with those transcripts. Uh, and see kind of, here's how this happens. Here, here's uh, here's how they get to somebody. Uh, in the case of Val Brokesman, who's one of the ones, he, he died uh, at the beginning of the Ukraine war. He was, he was one of six people connected to the uh, Trump Deutsche Bank Russia investigation who fell off something in that first week. Uh, he was the only one who fell in, off something in the US and died such that it was not deemed suspicious. Uh, his colleagues all died in Russia where the U.S. press has no no problem realizing, oh, maybe this should be looked into. Maybe it was a murder. Uh, that person who was originally a whistleblower who, who testified to Adam, Sh Adam Schiff's committee on Russia and Trump and on Cambridge Analytica and all that, and who was otherwise uh, pursuing a lot of useful uh, things for the FBI, for a portion of the FBI and for the Congress, uh, the way they turned him, essentially, uh, aside from him initially also being kind of a... a uh, a person of, of complicated morals was that he had a child, or his girlfriend's child, who had been taken up by California uh, Child Protective Services, and he wanted them back. And the FBI uh, assets told him, we could help with that. Why don't you come out to this meeting in L.A. and we'll talk about how we can figure out, get, get your child back and we'll do all this. And, they, and at the meeting himself, which he also recorded and which we have, uh, which is noted in the book as well, um, you know, they they lie to him more, and it's like we're really interested in how we can help get this kid back, blah blah. And then the then they bring the subject around to me and the other uh, targets that are they're interested in. And, and Val is asking them, you know, hey, you know, what has he done that you're pursuing him again? You know, and they won't tell him. Uh, so from these conversations, which are extremely inv invaluable, I mean, these I don't I don't know of much many recordings we have or uh, other documentation whereby we can see for for certain what is being said between FBI and the police intelligence agencies and their assets, uh, you can you can glean quite a bit about what to look for, what to be concerned about. Uh, and that's, you know, it, and that that's kind of part of the reason why the things that we put out on these matters, uh, including things that are otherwise extremely attractive to the press, you know, uh, a, a, a potential murder of someone who's testifying against Russia and Deutsche Bank and who testified for Congress, uh, that kind of thing. That's why one of the reasons why very few people know about it, even people who, who follow these issues. Um, if someone dies like Aaron Schwartz or Kevin Gallagher or Val Brokesmith, and the first articles you see about that death 
or in Vice, and they're talking about how there's a conspiracy theory about their death. There's a right-wing conspiracy theory. That's always a good sign that you need to look into what that person was doing. Uh, some of these things, some of these kind of articles about how, oh, this guy died, conspiracy theories are occurring, as opposed to like, this guy died, he was a journalist, let's see what he was working on. Uh, that is a That happens organically, naturally. There's a lot of journalists who really don't know any better. Uh, they don't. They don't think that there's a. It, they believe what they've read elsewhere. Uh, they believe their instincts. Uh, they generally they tend not to believe that assassinations occur, except in these agreed upon circumstances in Russia and elsewhere. Uh, and they're they're all sort of at the same mindset that a, a conspiracy theory is a real useful term that uh, any reporter is qualified to to use to designate some subject they haven't looked into. Uh, that other journalists have and just say, oh, that's, that's, you know, silly. They're all that very similar mindset. Uh, and so that's, again, that's the thing we're up against. Uh, we're not just up against our people dying. We're up against the fact that when we try to look into uh, who was talking to them before they died and who was threatening them uh, and which of them were FBI assets, we find that we are denounced as conspiracy theorists or ignored or something because that's what some of the reporters are saying, including some reporters who actually worked with those people. And who know better? Um, that's an upsetting thing, I can tell you. Um, when you're trying to look, trying to figure out why your friend disappeared the day before you were arrested in London, and uh, and uh, he was being approached by a number of the same FBI assets, including some who have bragged about causing suicides, and then you send somebody to their home two weeks later in San Francisco, and they find him dead, uh, and the autopsy has the wrong dates and and of his death and all this. It's very frustrating uh, to learn, as I did. Uh, this is kind of what what made it very difficult for me last uh, a couple of years ago to learn that uh, you are not going to be given much leeway to do the same investigations as you always do about these same people when it comes to your friend's death, because it's already been decided that it can't be the result of anything untoward, anything that the public might need to know. Uh, it doesn't matter what comes up. It doesn't matter who's bragging about it after the fact. It doesn't matter who we've caught, uh, Engaging with this person, uh, whether also representing uh, the not neo-Nazi leader Joey Camps, it just doesn't matter what we have. Um, the story is already set in the minds of, of most observers uh, pretty quickly after these after these deaths occur, or after anything else that kind of nature occurs. And once they've written that advice article saying, "Oh, it's wacky, wacky uh, conspiracy theories about this guy's death," and here's a guy who barely here's someone who barely knows him saying, "Hey, stop." desecrating my friend's memory with the conspiracy theories. Once that point's been reached, the reporters in question and the other activists who dismissed it, you know, uh, they are now wedded to the storyline that this death didn't matter. They're wedded to the storyline that the things that happened before the death didn't matter. They're wedded, you know, by career, by ego, by emotion, uh, by their knowledge of how other people perceive these things. They are wedded to that narrative whereby nothing is worth investigating when a, when a journalist dies under odd circumstances. And it doesn't matter what comes up. And so that's that's really that's a big part of what's now happening, what's been happening the last few years, and what's going to continue to happen is there's going to be a more and more severe uh, divergence between what the press as a whole is going to have access to, uh, what the public as a whole is going to have access to, and what a number of us uh, who the, the public occasionally sees as reliable, what we know, what we can document because it, it becomes impossible and in fact counterproductive to, to discuss these things outside the setting of very militants, very committed revolutionaries uh, and, and a overlapping segment of, of uh, high-end journalists who remember these issues. I mean, the, these things are all are exclusively at this point, they're investigated quietly now. Uh, it's just too, it's too difficult to, to, to try to get, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's difficult to get, much assistance, even in the form of, of uh, people just not attacking us for doing our jobs on this. Uh, and so, you know, that's probably a bad thing. I think it would be better if the sort of vanguard of transparency uh, activists and whistleblowers and so forth, it would be better if they could feel comfortable talking to the press and certain, even certain of our colleagues in the activist sphere about these things they're concerned with, uh, without knowing that the odds are they're going to lose influence as a result. They're going to be looked on as crazy. They're going to be targeted more by these same assets as a result. Um, but the silver lining is that that will probably, over the time, uh, 
force us to worry less about these media flows we can't really control and maybe focus more on what we can do without having to put on the New York Times or a lawyer with the Freedom of the Press Foundation uh, to agree with us about our research. So that might, in the the years to come, uh, that might help to better incubate a cohesive, self-confident, effective, uh, solid, and uh, less penetrable uh, version of the different groups I've been involved with in the past. Uh, you just answered like eight different questions I was <laughs> going to ask you. So, I hope, I hope so. Um, uh, so let's talk a little bit about the alt-right and what's going on right now. And then just finish off with, you know, what are the things that are on top of mind for you? Uh, of course, your book, but also <laughs> just uh, the issues as well. Sure. Um, so top of mind, I guess, so when you mentioned earlier, you know, the dossier on, on, uh, on these assets, that's something that we would, I would like to see built. I can't do it because anything I, I, any organizational thing I create is swarmed by contractors who are trying to build their, even if what I'm doing isn't useful to anyone, a, an intelligence contractor has a impetus to tell their FBI or their employer, Hey, this, this Barry Brown guy, he's really dangerous. He's coming after Bank of America. Here's my invoice for the last 20 hours of this information and surveillance. So I can't do these things that I that I've talked so much about doing that, that you know that I've brought in people to help figure out the, the, the frameworks. But others certainly can. And between that, between having a list of the assets and their modus operandi and documentation, which reporters they're friends with, uh, also having a a similar uh, a similar searchable archive of the reporters that we know to be working with, have worked with the FBI or GCHQ or to be confident in doing so. That's another thing that would be of great use. And also, I think uh, if it is done properly, will finally uh, cause some of the press in the U.S. especially to think more about curating itself, uh, not letting these things occur under the watch. Because, of course, they look if they look bad for it, that's the threshold we need to hit. We're not going to convince anybody at the New York Times, like, hey, this guy, he, here's an email with him in Stratford. Uh, conspiring against activists. He's your editor and reporter. Maybe you can look into that. That's not going to happen. It's never worked. Not with any, not with the New Yorker, not with, you know. Um, so what we have to have is the, we have to focus on how can we, and this is something I've, been, I've not been good with, how do we harness the newer the newer ways of, of which mediums work? That How do we harness the things that everyone else is using, whether it be grifters or actual people, to get people's attention, how do we do that and focus that attention on the things that are urgent and uh, critical? Uh, so others with with ideas on how to do that or the apparatus, uh, you know, I'm I'm more than happy to advise to provide documentation that we've come up with in terms of how we how can we how can we get these groups to work properly? How do you do cohesive crowdsource research? You know, I'll help out I'll help out anyone uh, with that, uh, assuming they're you know on the on the anarchist left or or something adjacent to that. Um, and it's, it's exactly what's needed um, until until all of us. I don't know who, who I mean by us. I guess people who are committed and honest and uh, want to see these problems solved. Until we're all on the same page in terms of, uh, in, until we're better taking advantage of the information uh, on our enemies and on these tactics that a lot of people have died in the process of accumulating for us. Until we take that stuff seriously. Until I can do a better job of presenting it. Uh, you know we're just not going to get very far. Uh, so th- those are the kind of projects detailing these things, documenting them, figuring out how do we document these properly? How do we avoid the pitfalls of crowdsourced research? How do we avoid infiltration? Uh, those are, those are the key subjects. Those are the subjects that, that have to be addressed before anything else. Um, in the meantime, uh, you know, the best, the most important thing I can do and that others, you know, who are interested in this can do is to familiarize themselves with, the things we do have, the the, the, com- the the FBI and their emails with other companies, you need to know who's dirty, who we can prove is dirty. Uh, and so when that person uh, writes something about something you know about uh, or, or it writes an adverse article that has an impact on your cause and on your, your colleagues, you'll be in a position to publicly you know, uh, point out where their real interests lie, what they've done wrong before uh, in a way that their outlets will not defend. That's the other takeaway that I guess uh, I want people, if people are wondering whether or not they should read this rambling guy's book and his articles and so forth. Just keep in mind that when we, 
when we accomplish, when, when, when we do our thing, uh, it is almost inv invariably in a way that the people we're targeting, the people we're investigating, the people we're exposing do not have an answer to it. They do not have, the, there's nothing in our, in our cases that we make that uh, can be explained away. Uh, that's why our, the subjects, subject of my articles, you know, I'm, I'm here in the UK where I could be sued very easily for libel and slander. That's something to keep that in mind when we read the book, see what I put in there and, and then look at the uh, things I put out. Uh, we don't, when we shoot, we don't miss. Uh, we make it a point not to miss because we want to be credible and we don't, you know, we're just not into missing in the first place. Um, in a world where so many grifters and sort of self-interested uh, parties have sort of taken up so much of the oxygen, it's understandable that people would uh, see perhaps an article about me, you know, I'm, you know, and say, oh, that guy sounds like a Fruit Loop or he's, you know, he sounds like he has PTSD and he's just making stuff up or he's just silly. Um, that, that, that level of information gathering in terms of who, determining who we support, who we listen to, who we read, is not gonna be enough going into this age. It hasn't been enough the last 10 years. Um, so yeah, so that's, those, are the, those are the chief topics that, you know, as, as a media critic, which is what I was in the years immediately before my, my revolutionary career took off, um, that, those are the things that worried me then. Uh, they worry me far more now that I've had the chance to see it from so many angles. Um, and they're the things that uh, I think anarchists will have to fix. Um, to the extent that anarchists have been, been positioned last 120 years where they've uh, they've been the ones to call out the errors in what's coming forward before, uh, you know, when other on the others on the left uh, were not willing to do so. Going back to Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman and others who went to uh, the early Soviet Union and said, this is what they're doing wrong. Uh, sometimes we're listened to. And in those cases, we're able to have an impact. We're able to spare a lot of people a lot of pain. And we're able to uh, ensure that our movements won't be uh, dismissed and, 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 or, or cataloged with some other terrible thing that we don't endorse. Uh, that has to be our strength is, is being candid, being willing to explain anything, being willing to acknowledge our mistakes. And uh, uh, at the most, at the very top of that list, uh, to be consistently engaged in the business of exposing the worst and most relevant things to the most people. Uh, that's how we will get to a point where we can draw have more people to draw upon. Uh, we can help us design software, help us build catalogs, help us engage in, you know, cogent, ongoing efforts of the sort that are, are needed, that if we don't do them, no one else will, uh, as, as we go into this, this more fascist uh, era that we're entering into. Well, I, I think that's a really good note to, to end this on. It would be great to have you back sometime or we'll talk about some more detailed things when you have things you want to say, whatever, I'm always open to it, but I really appreciate you coming on and doing this, especially uh, sort of weird timing, not knowing you had a book coming out and uh, already well, agreeing good. to do this. So well, thank you very much. No, I appreciate it. I'll come back anytime and I'm happy to discuss any of these issues. I can go on all day. I'll try not to, you know, um, but I hope I hope I gave a sense of what what it is that uh, what the real concerns or the chief concerns are uh, in my corner of things. I think so. All right. 